Hi guys, welcome to the channel. With you is your gracious host Steve. Today we're going to be talking about the subject of addiction in general. With with me is going to be my co-host Sean today to talk about this. And first of all, you can introduce yourself and tell us what you do for work. And go ahead. Uh, my name is Sean, and I am licensed in my state as a drug and alcohol counselor, or we would call an alcohol and drug counselor, I should say. And I've been doing that for the last five years and I have about 15 years experience in the behavioral health field and right now I work for a local agency uh, with people that are in recovery from uh, opiate addiction in particular and they sometimes struggle with other things as well all right so what do you th what direction do you think like agencies are actually currently going on is in regards to treatment like what are they focused on with the client um the what most people do is a combination of what they call mat or medication assisted treatment so the person usually uh meets with a counselor to do an intake and they figure out if they meet the criteria to be a member like they have a history of substance use that involves opiates and then the person will meet with a doctor to find out what kind of dose level they can get on of Suboxone, what they call buprenorphine. And uh, then the person gets a script for Suboxone. And as uh, one of the requirements of being in the MAT program is you have to attend weekly counseling sessions with a group of your peers as well. Wow. Now... Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't they use group therapy a lot? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, it's it's not a mental health kind of therapy, um, but it's like psychoeducation or educating the mind. Um, a lot of the things that I like to talk about uh, relate to the different curriculums that you have at the local agencies. Um, some of them uh, in, that I've used at different places where I've worked are like Seeking Safety is one. Um, another one's called the Matrix Model. Another one is called uh, Living in Balance. Um, there's a, other ones as well. Positive Recovery is from Positive Psychology. And there's many different types of curriculum that people can use to get information to share with the group. Um, but they also want to have the members that come to the group or the participants to give each other support and talk about how things are going in terms of if they've had any episodes of use and if they've had any triggers or um, moments where they wanted to use and the idea is to get them to talk about what was going on for them that led them to use um, to kind of see themselves as a a scientist practitioner might like you know how sometimes scientists go overseas to a foreign country and they might spend time with a population of people that they normally aren't around and they might participate in activities with those people but they're also taking notes and trying to learn about what's going on and so we want for the people that come to group to uh, learn about themselves in a way that a, a non-judgmental observer might and say oh okay so whenever <laughs> you know, Billy gets uh, lonely, he uses, or whenever he uh, feels uh, stressed, he uses to try to escape or avoid or his feelings or his un uncomfortable thoughts, something like that. So hopefully they talk about any episodes of use, they talk about triggers, times when they were in a high-risk situation uh, where they wanted to use, and uh, how they might deal with that in a way that gets them through that tough time without using so it's and then it's a way for them to support each other and also an opportunity to give each other a high five you know symbolically maybe not physically in these covid times but a chance to give each other some props for doing well and to encourage each other when they start to get off track nice nice from your experience the clients that have gone through programs that you've worked at and all the agencies you, you've worked at, what do you think the actual like way they were successful, like the clients that actually succeed, what are the behaviors that you're seeing that led to their personal success? Um, well, it looks like I, I often describe uh, the value of MAT or medication assisted treatment 
as kind of like as a as a metaphor or a word picture you could think of those there's a certain type of uh glider airplane i think that it attaches to another airplane or aircraft and then it the one of the aircrafts takes the other one up to a certain altitude and then it basically lets go and it is able to fly on its own after that so i think of suboxone as being helpful from my non-medical point of view, right? I'm, I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. I'm not a doctor or a mental health person or anything like that. But from my point of view, what I notice is it seems to help the group participant that's in the MAT program to be able to uh, stop having to engage in the drug seeking activities on the street. You know, they're not having to do dangerous things or possibly engage in criminal acts or things that might harm, put themselves in danger or harm themselves socially or physically or emotionally or in some other way. And so the Suboxone helps them to kind of stabilize their cravings and withdrawals so they don't have to worry about getting sick from withdrawal. And uh, they're able to focus on the, the other big thing, which I think of um, as their ability to create situations that are good for their recovery. So by being on Suboxone, it, it frees up their thoughts and focus and their energy and their time and their money resources to focus on other things like getting a car, like your some of your case management type functions that a case manager might do with someone, like getting a vehicle, getting a job, getting an apartment, being around positive, supportive people that mm -hmm. like them and want them to recover. And then also they can start to maybe go to the gym or go for a walk and then they over time you see their situation get set up in a way that is more conducive to recovery where hopefully from my point of view over time they'll start to be able to get high naturally from their life because they're having good experiences with their boyfriends and girlfriends husbands and wives partners and their family and friends and their um, working and being productive and feeling like they can be creative. And also, I think having a sense of purpose and being able to do the things that they love and not being treated poorly by others and not treating others poorly um, is going to be really crucial to them having a natural release of endorphins, what I call getting high naturally. Mm. So if you had to like summarize what you would think of the best overall overall arching message to the client if you had to like describe recovery in like one paragraph what would that look like if like like what would you say like a new client walking in that's right off the street yeah what what's the first paragraph you're going to say to him about getting you know off his drugs um i usually say that uh, my treatment philosophy is that each of us is the manager of our own recovery journey and also the manager of our day-to-day -day life situation. <clears throat> and so we want to try to engage in what I call lifescaping. It's like landscaping, but for your life, where you're going to get things out of your life that you don't want there, that are tearing you down and making you want to use or ruining your social experiences, right? Nobody likes feeling bad and or rejected and sad and stuff all the time, although it is great to feel. And we want to do that. Um, each of us is on this recovery journey. And every time that we choose to be brave and face a problem and we find a way through the problem, uh, we're going to get a reward from that. And it's going to increase our personal power or our ability to solve problems. And so recovery is kind of like a problem solving journey that you're going to keep going on over and over again. First, you're going to try to you know, get stuff out of your life you don't want there. Then you're going to bring stuff into your life that you do want. And then you're going to enjoy it. And then you're going to protect it when someone tries to wreck it. And so you're the main character in the story of your recovery. And uh, every time you go on a problem-solving journey, just like anybody in the movies would, uh, any ordinary mortal that becomes heroic, um, that's all of, our, all of us are on that journey, including me. And so... You're always going to have to face tough times and adversity, but if you can keep going through it and um, with the help of MAT, then 
medication assisted treatment, uh, which will definitely increase your odds. It's kind of like a secret weapon. Uh, you're much more likely to have positive outcome, uh, positive life outcomes in the long mm -hmm. run um, because you're going to become more empowered over time and your life is going to keep getting better. Even though it gets harder, you get mm -hmm. stronger and things end up being better than they would otherwise. So it sounds like you have to take care of some of the core issues first, like managing the addiction. And that would be through the medication assisted treatment. Yeah. Because like without that, all the client can think of is where am I going to get my next fix, whatever drug it is, where am I going to get my fix? And that's all they can think about. Right. So they never reach a level of clarity of the mind to actually focus on things that are going to help lead to their recovery. So once they get the medication, then they can start, you know, learning how to get sober, learning about coping skills, learning how to manage stress without drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Things like that. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of times even uh, learning to believe in themselves that they can do it and that they are capable and mm -hmm. having hope that things will get better. Um, and uh, learning to just observe that, you know, how using substances makes them feel. And then finding natural ways to feel that way. You know, like I used to tell guys that I work with in prison that it's it's a crime, right, to break and enter into someone's house. But if it gives you an adrenaline rush, having an adrenaline rush is not a crime. So you just have to find a way to get an adrenaline rush without doing something illegal, like going bungee jumping or skydiving. And for people that, you know, maybe opiates gives them energy, well, I like to say um, figuring out what your current life purpose is and then doing it will also give you energy because mm. I get a sense of energy when I do things that I love, which is like audio, video editing and creating content like this, you know, and uh, some people get energy from other creative activities. But if you never spend any time doing that, then you're not going to have that, you know, positive experience. Mm. And so. Also, I noticed a lot of times people use stimulants and they describe to me that it makes them feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And a lot of times they also describe that they're in a hostile situation when they're doing that. Like I had one lady that was, you know, had a partner that was mistreating her and she was going to, you know, the cops about it and stuff. And it was a scary time for her and the state was threatening to take her kids away and, um, this was several years ago, and uh, but that person was using stimulants to make themselves kind of armor up in a hostile situation. And so mm -hmm. um, what I like to do is instead of using stimulants to armor up, I use heroism and personal empowerment to armor up. Mm -hmm. And I learn who around me is safe to be around and who do I need to set limits with and believing in myself even when no one else does. Mm. Um, so that I stay f in a sense of empowerment mentally and um, emotionally. Yeah. And then uh, I like to, I can't prove this, of course, because I haven't done the scientific research or anything, but I've noticed that a lot of times when people have had a history of using benzos, they, they also describe that they have a hard time taking a compliment and they tend to deflect praise statements. And a lot of times they'll talk about how benzos makes them feel good about themselves and that they're, everything's good. And so I think, wow, you know, getting a compliment makes me feel that way. And um, accepting praise statements helps me. So uh, one of the things I always encourage them to do is to learn how to receive praise and feel good when they're giving a, someone's giving them a compliment. And in these ways, you can increase the release of these naturally occurring endorphins that are found in drugs. And uh, you can access them in a natural way, like I just mentioned. Yeah. And I think like speaking from my own, my own self, cause I've also had my share of, you know, addiction problems, things like that, that I've worked on. But for me, when I relate consequences to my use, that's a lot of times what motivates me, like, especially with alcohol, you know, like I kind of identified as an alcoholic growing up and stuff like that. Yeah. So when I think of the consequences of my actions, like tomorrow I'm going to work and I don't want to go to work with a hangover. That's how it motivates me as being like future oriented rather than moment oriented. Because I think a lot of my past behaviors were just, what am I doing tonight and who cares about tomorrow? 
Mm. But when I started like caring about, I don't want to be a horrible employee tomorrow because I'm hungover. That's what really started motivating me to stay sober and, and, yeah. and also wanting to stay out of trouble. You know, like I've been to jail a few times probably because of my drinking, you know, like wanting to do the right thing and wanting to change, you know, and be a better, make better choices in the moment. Yeah. Know? And, um, uh, I got into this because I used to abuse alcohol. So I didn't get the alcoholism gene, I don't think, but I got the wanting to numb out my emotional distress by using alcohol. And that's because I was growing up in a home where there was a lot of domestic violence and things going on that were painful to be around and to experience. And I also uh, lost my dad to alcoholism. He died of liver failure from drinking. And he spent 20 years before that on the streets of Las Vegas uh, addicted to crystal meth, amphetamine. Mm -hmm. And I used to get the calls as the oldest. I'd get the calls from him. You know, at night where he was barking like a dog, telling me about how he had a dream that he was a dog in my apartment and stuff. And he was obviously under the influence. And um, I'd hear about how he had been tased or beaten up or taken to the hospital um, and even thrown down a flight of stairs once. So he ended up passing away at like 56. So that really led me to feel uh, like I wanted to be a part of trying to find a solution because uh, during one of the last things that happened with him involved him going to the hospital and the nurse said, asked him, what is, what do you do for a coping skill? And he said, what's a coping skill? And so it made me realize that he, he had no education, right? That goes back to that psychoeducation thing, educating the mind. He had no training or education around how to manage day-to-day -day life in a way that would lead to positive life outcomes. And of course, now more people are getting that training and that opportunity, and I'm really happy to be a part of that, uh, working for a local agency. And um, also, uh, I was going to say on your point um, that uh, people developing uh, sort of a big picture view rather than being in the moment. You know, like, you know, and I know a lot of AA and NA stuff talks about um, day by day, and I believe in that, and I agree with that, and I actually mm -hmm. take it a step further and say to go moment by moment, right? Like, what can I do in this moment to make this moment a good experience, right? And so the big word for that that I might use is experience management. If you mm -hmm. want to have a better life so you can get high naturally, then you need to start managing your experiences. Mm. And if you want to manage your experiences, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by learning how to modify your situation that you're in right now, right? So you're mm. not going to just take it one day at a time. You're going to take it one moment at a time. Yeah. Because in every moment, there's a different situation. But if you can manage one situation right now, you can manage one later. And the only thing you need to know in order to be able to manage a situation is, is the situation um, supportive of my recovery goals? Is it neutral towards my recovery goals? Or is it antagonistic or against my recovery goals, right? Are there people trying to get me to use? Are there people mistreating me or trying to get me to act out? Well, that's antagonistic. How do I manage that situation? Um, if it's neutral, like people don't care either way how I'm doing, then am I going to take advantage of that? And I'm going to try to create a good experience for myself and others to create a good situation so I can have a good experience. And then if it's supportive of my goals in recovery, then I want to work with those people and try to get further together than I could on my own. And like you said about having the future outcome, um, I like to say that we need to create our futures, right? Because people who create their future tend to have better ones. And uh, I think that's kind of my bigger message is that each of us is creating our life every moment of every day by the choices we make. And so if you want to have a better life, um, then choose to create situations that are good for you as a human being, right? Like I think a lot of people, they go wrong in their approach because they, they do what's good for their, their wants. Like I mm -hmm. want to see this, you know, person tonight on a date. I want to go with my friends to the bar. I want to be accepted by these people. I want to have this person respect me. But they do it in a way that um, ignores their own humanity. And so what I like to say is, 
when you're creating these situations every day, the way you're going to create them, you can tell they're good is if they're good for the human in you. So in other, in other words, instead of focusing on what you want, focus on getting what you need. What does the human being need? We, we're all human beings, right? So we all have similar needs. We want to feel safe. So what can I do to make safety happen? We want to feel hope. So what can I do to make hope happen? Uh, we want to feel like we have enough stuff, sufficiency, right? Like Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about how you need to have enough money, mm. clothing and food and shelter. So what can I do to make that happen? Yeah. And by focusing my agenda on making my needs come true first, then I can focus on my wants, right? So right. that when I finally do get that big break, I finally get that pretty woman partner or that man partner, whoever I'm going for, um, it'll just be one of the ways in which I'm a success rather than the only way. Thank you for that answer. I like that. Yeah. Now, without getting a question from me, specifically on, on the subject of addiction and alcoholism and stuff, is there any final thoughts you have for the final thought part? Um, let's see. Uh, not really. Just uh, thanks for letting me share. That was fun. Like, um, let's say, let's say, as a, as the, to end this video, if this is your last day with the client, yeah. What is your message to them? Um, I would want them to always be their own best friend. Um, I have this thing that I call um, uh, Be Like Sasquatch. You might have seen those memes where it shows Bigfoot, right, or Sasquatch. And it says, believe in yourself even when no one else does. Because one of the things that happens when you start a recovery journey is that you're going to start doing things differently than your family and friends. And unfortunately, you're going to be moving from what I call the discomfort zone or your comfort zone. Mm. You're going to be moving towards an empowerment zone. But mm. before you get there, you have to go through the conflict zone. And that means that you're going to have to go through a period of time where your way of doing things is not a match for the people that you used to hang out with. And sometimes those people might really believe that what you're doing is bad or wrong because maybe you're setting limits and you used to not set limits. You used to let people walk on you. Maybe now you're having a high sense of self-esteem, like you were saying, you know what, I do actually matter, and I'm not going to tolerate being mistreated anymore. Mm. And so they're going to think that you're being a jerk because they're not used to that being okay in the family or friend group. And so you have to be like Sasquatch and believe in yourself even when no one else does. Awesome. Now, as just an added question before we close, what part of environment do you think plays in addiction? Um, I think it's actually a really big part. And I think if I could uh, change the, you know, the systems of all the different places that do these programs, it would just be to really keep focusing on that and how to do what we call culture building. Um, because whether you're at home or you're at work or you're at school or you're at church or on the school bus, um, Everywhere you are, you're like a plant in a, in a soil, right? You're like a, a plant in a garden. And you need to be in the soil that is nutrient rich. And in this case, it's your social uh, experiences. So we want to try to create codes of conduct at home and at work and at school and at church. Um, and I've been fortunate to work at places that already have this established. Um, you want to try to create a code of conduct for people that come into those places, I got some flies buzzing around me here, sorry. You wanna be able to create a code of conduct that ensures that people are gonna treat each other in a way that will facilitate those good experiences. So like, I like to say that if you want people to feel equality of value as an experience, right, we want everyone to feel equally valued so they can have a sense of community. Yeah. Well then we wanna to try to approach people with both self-interest and humanity, a genuine concern for the welfare of others. Self-interest means, you know, being concerned about what my needs are and what, and if I'm getting them met. But humanity means being concerned about others. So I call that a virtue pair uh, because they both go together. If you have too much self-interest, you can act a little bit 
self-centered. And if you have too much humanity, you might act like a doormat, right? And just yeah. be overly... Thinking of the other person. Yes. Yeah. And then you're not thinking of yourself. And I like to say to those people, without a, without a me, there can't be a we. So yeah. in order uh, for people to experience a sense that everyone is valued, uh, we yeah. have to each approach and respond with that virtue pairing of yeah. equality, of, uh, excuse me, self-interest and humanity.